Hello and welcome back one last time to the Fullerton College Pre-Press class. That's a combined lecture for print 75 and 77. This is Professor Ben Hewitt. We will be going through our last chapter in the Pre-Press Trainees Manual from the PIA. This is section 3.7, Proofing. So proofing is a central concept to life, day-to-day -day life in pre-press. It's one of our main roles, or it was in, uh, in my experience, I did a lot of this, and it's a very important thing. So we're going to look at what proofing is. We're going to look at the advantages and different disadvantages of different ways of doing proofs, look at good practices in evaluating proofs, look at the tools needed to, uh, to evaluate them, and then talk about viewing conditions and what they do to appearance. Some of you should already be chuckling, chuckling at our semi-related video I posted to the class, because heh <laughs> heh. Anyways. Let's dive right in. So in printing, a proof is a preliminary representation of what the eventual printed piece will be like. I know I don't like reading directly off of slides and PowerPoint karaoke is boring to hear, but this one's an important one. It's the preliminary representation of what the eventual printed piece will look like. It is not an exact copy, although it can be very, very close. Sometimes it can be exact if you're only running digital, by the way. Uh, but it is a way of showing a client what it is they're going to be getting before you produce it. And as with all forecasts and all fortune telling and future predictions, it's only as accurate as it can be. It's not necessarily perfect. Things will deviate from what you thought you saw, uh, but it's a good way of getting as close as possible. And how close can you get? That depends on how you make the proof and how you calibrate it and how you see and how you view. There are a lot of factors that go into how close it is. We will talk about those with no shortage of anecdotes, don't you worry. There are two main types of proofs, and both of them are important, although they're important for different reasons. Content proofs are more of a way for clients to make sure that the graphics are what they think they are, to make sure it's the correct file and the correct words have been written and the correct uh, layout is there, uh, making sure that all the arrangements, the pages are set up correctly, it's all gonna line up the way it's supposed to. That's a content proof. Content proofs are vitally important. One of the biggest fails, one of the biggest uh, problems I've ever seen in a print shop uh, with this sort of thing happened at one of my last jobs where I had a semi-regular client come to us and I don't wanna make them sound like horrible people, uh, but they were in a rush and they more or less demanded that we just print the file, just print the thing, go to the FTP site, download it and print it. We're like, well, we need to show you a proof of what this looks like to make sure that everything's good. Like, no, we don't have time for proofs. We don't have time to waste with looking and signing things, just print it. And so we did. In the end, it turns out they directed us to the wrong file, not the file they wanted, but an old version of the file that was also in the same folder in their FTP site that they directed us to. And it led to some problems of them not wanting to pay for it, even though we produced the whole thing for them all because they didn't want to see a proof. Hopefully I've impressed on you with that, the importance of making sure that a proof happens. You need to show uh, people what exactly they're gonna be getting as close to as possible. Remember that looking more generously and less uh, meanly at it with the whole Dunning-Kruger effect, if you know things, one of the mistakes you make is assuming that other people also know it. And if you don't know things, you don't know that you don't know them. You don't know that there are categories of information that you're missing. You can walk around blissfully unaware of problems that we face all the time in printing and in pre-press, as most people do. So we need to make, find a way of getting people to understand what's going to happen and what they're going to get. Um, if, there's, if they have any unrealistic expectations, it's better to burst those bubbles sooner rather than later. You don't wanna burst the expectation bubble right around the same time that you're asking for money. Ask me how that goes. Anyways, that's a content proof. Contract proofs are a much closer prediction of the final output on the press. This is saying not only is this where all the layout is and these are the correct pictures, and not only do we spell everything right and is it all there, but this is the color that my press is going to make. Any of you who have taken my color class with me know that that's a pretty bold statement to go and make somebody, showing them a sample that's printed probably on a different press. That's like Babe Ruth pointing to the outfield with the baseball bat, calling where his home run's gonna go. 
And we do that all the time in printing. Uh, we are that good and that consistent with what we produce that we know what our results are and we're able to calibrate presses to produce each other. This is more tricky though. It's not as simple as a content proof because a content proof, if it's not telling you exactly what the colors are, I mean, you could just email a PDF and that's a good enough content proof. People can look at it and say, yep, picture's in the right place. Yep, it's the right size, good to go. But a contract proof, you got to show them, including what the paper is going to look like, how it's going to feel, how everything's going to be in place, how does the paper affect the ink, how does the actual chemistry and uh, color mixing work. That's stuff you can't see from um, other places, or from online or from on a computer screen or printed on a different kind of paper. Contract proofs are trickier and sometimes cost more for having more specialized equipment. This book will tell you that you can have a contract proof done over a computer connection. They say it, they stand by it. I still don't believe in it, but that's my own personal problem. You know, <laughs> that's my own beliefs and skepticism about the accuracy of people's monitors. Uh, I still don't like it. I'm not comfortable. I like hard proofs, but that's me. Proofs can be hard or soft. If you want a hard proof, you have to be at least 21 and have proper identification. I'm kidding. Hard proofs means it's printed on paper or some other substrate that can be held in the hand. It's tangible, it's there. Um, that lets people hold it and feel it and look at it. Uh, there are many ways of doing this. There are inkjet methods. If you guys remember back to when we used to meet in person, there's that large format printer in the computer lab in 901C in our, uh, in our print area, in the computer lab. And its job was to print proofs. It was calibrated to print color the same way that the Heidelberg offset press would print color so that you could produce a reasonable reasonably close estimate of what the Heidelberg was going to do. Ablative printing is really, really cool and very expensive, and as such, I've never gotten to play with it. It sounds ridiculously cool. We'll get into it more later about how it works, but dang, would it be fun. Uh, it sounds expensive as all get out, by the way. Toner-based, i.e. electrostatic, i.e. we're saying facial tissue instead of Xerox here, <laughs> instead of Kleenex here, and I mean Xeroxing, uh, Xerox-type digital presses, uh, that's toner-based. And there's other ways of doing it, too, for hard proofs. Soft proofs means you're viewing it through a computer monitor. Software, soft proof, think about it. Digital proof, so non-inkjet. Uh, the ablative type things uses something called donor sheets, where you have a pre-printed sheet of paper covered in an ink, and then parts of that ink are lasered off with a ablative laser. Ablate means you're removing things. Uh, I know this from nerdy games because spaceships with a blade of armor means once you get shot, that part of the armor falls off. And, yeah. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> uh, so ablation uh, printing means you're going to be removing some of the ink from the donor sheet, and then it's going to press the donor sheet onto the paper. The advantage of that, actually, you know what? We're not we're not to advantage of that. I'm getting ahead of myself as I like to do. I'm so excited for the punchline that I can't tell the whole joke. Then um, the ink jets. We all know what ink jets are. They use small droplets of ink. Uh, remember, for you art reproduction people, if in the high art world, they would call this gicle for art reproduction, and that just means tiny bubbles, in, like French or something. And uh, all that really means is it's an inkjet print. Um, you can't see my very um, knowing nods and eyeballs right now because I'm just showing you the slides, but understand that I'm giving a very knowing look because I say gicle and um, inkjet. It's an inkjet. Inkjets, there are lots of types and lots of different levels of inkjet of accuracy and cost. So it's all about how much, how close can it get? It depends on a lot of factors. So the advantages of non-inkjet, the ablative type stuff, is you can show real halftone dots. The non-inkjet ablative systems are basically a plate maker that makes a one-time use plate. And that one-time use, like, well, makes four one-time use plates or more if you have spot color donor sheets but it will take off some of the ink from the donor sheet and then transfer it onto the paper. And it uses the exact same dots that your offset plate maker would make, which means if people are being really, really finicky about wanting to see exactly what something's gonna look like, this can do it. It also means that it can proof on weird substrates. So if you're printing a job that's gonna be on foil paper or plastics, like um, I think packaging type stuff, or print it on weird stock that can't be run through normal printing presses and inkjets aren't gonna work, the ablative process lets you simulate pretty accurately to a client what it's going to look like to actually print on that awkward substrate. Isn't that great? It can even have um, spot color sometimes and it can uh, simulate metallic ink sometimes depending on the system and it's very consistent. It looks the same way every time because it's a very high-end, very accurate precision machine. The disadvantages, 
and these are the, the, the reasons that I've never gotten to use one because I've always come from smaller shops, um, it's extremely expensive. It costs as much as a plate maker to get one of these because it basically is a plate maker. And the consumables, those donor sheets, I mean, you're basically using money to print at that point. It's like liquid money turned into ink and then put onto your paper. And it's, uh, it's prohibitive for anything but large shops to do that sort of thing. And it's also much slower than an inkjet. An inkjet you can prove pretty quick. <laughs> Knowing that if you're proofing a whole size of plate for a press sheet on like our uh, Epson in the back of the print lab, you're still looking at like a 45 minute print job. So understand that we're talking about this being slow compared to a 45 minute print job. And it has to do it four times or more if you have more than four plates. Inkjet is pretty quick. It's, uh, you can do very large formats. You can do imposition proofing. You can proof on what a whole press sheet's gonna look like on an inkjet. That's why you use wide format to do this stuff. It's very fast compared to other methods. And you can also do it for other things. One of the big advantages of inkjet versus your ablative system is an ablative proofing system is only good for one single thing, which is making those proofs. But if you have a large format inkjet press floating around, you can proof with it. And then when you're not proofing, you can print posters, you can print signs, you can print photos, you can print all sorts of things on it. And it's still a usable piece of equipment for other stuff. In airplane terms, the difference between having a purpose-built air superiority fighter, like an F-15 or an F-22, and that would be your ablative system, or having something like an F-16 or F-18 uh, for your inkjet, which is not quite as amazing in the high speed and the high capabilities, but it's multi-role. It can do more things. It can, you know, attack ground targets. It can do radar interdiction missions. It doesn't always have to be just that one thing. So it's less specialized, which makes it less accurate and less amazing and less consistent, but it does make it more useful. It's kind of also the difference between driving a pickup truck around, which can do lots of things, versus having like a Formula One race car. The Formula One race car certainly has better performance, but it doesn't help you much when you also want to use it to help your friend move on the weekend or when you want to haul a bunch of gardening equipment around. You can't do that in the Formula One racer. It's too high, high performance. And that's your ablative system. It's very expensive and it's very specific. Uh, inkjets, although they're getting better about this, you're limited in the substrates. I'm not going to say it's manufacturing supplied anymore. That has changed. But you don't have the same amount of substrate ability on an inkjet proofing press. Note to those who are saying, but what about the big one in the back of our our lab, you know, the giant uh, EFI, the, what do we call it, the highlighter. What about that one? Well, that's a special type of press and that's not for proofing. The color on that is not good enough or consistent enough to run an actual content, or sorry, contract proof against an ink, uh, against a uh, offset print to be able to say that that's gonna be that good. Um, you know, the halftone dots are a little bit too coarse. It just wouldn't quite work for that. It's specialized in printing on weird substrates but think more like the Epson in the computer lab is the one that we're talking about for this. Moving on. Spot colors and proofing. Spot colors cannot always be accurate in a, in a proof because most proofing systems are gonna be four color process. Don't forget your problem with your bright blue. Everyone loves that super bright reflex blue, that blue that's just perfectly RGB basically, and it doesn't translate. You can't do it. It's impossible to make that out of CMYK. You get a dull purple. Like if any of you graduated from high schools that uh, had a blue colored graduation gown, sure, it's nice and bright blue the day you wear it, but uh, a month later it's turned kind of dull purple because the dye wasn't, wasn't color fast enough. Same kind of problem. Yeah, you, that perfect RGB color just does not translate. And also if you have like spot metallics or spot fluorescence, those other types of special ink additives that make them have those characteristics like the fluorescent UV reactant ink or the uh, metallic filaments and make it kind of glittery and sparkly. You can't do that with CMYK. You have to do that only with its own spot. And we're going to end and start the next video on my very favorite slide in this entire class. I love that picture. Let's zoom in on that. Substrate considerations. Don't forget that the colors you print, you don't print in a vacuum. The color you produce is not simply the color of the ink. The color that comes out on the final product is a combination of the color of the ink and the color and characteristics of the substrate you printed on.